goes to two carbon monoxide <coughs> gas. <coughs> so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to increase the concentration of O2. We're going to increase the concentration of O2. Are we still at equilibrium if I do this? Immediately after we do this, are we still at equilibrium? No, not at all. So we had a system at equilibrium. I added a stress on it. Stress is something that takes the system out of equilibrium. We are totally not at equilibrium anymore. So we put a stress upon this system. <coughs> What's the stress? Well, the stress is that we have too much oxygen to be in equilibrium. To respond to a stress, a reaction will either start reacting towards the forward direction, i.e. shift towards the right, or it could start have the re reverse reaction start proceeding, and so we say it shifts left. So in this case, because I have too much oxygen to be at equilibrium, because we just added a bunch of oxygen, what relieves that stress? Shifting right or shifting left? Right. Shifting right. I have too much oxygen, let's use it up and make some more product. So in this case, that's exactly what's going to happen. So if you increase the concentration of oxygen, we are going to shift the equilibrium to the right to get back to equilibrium. I'm going to decrease the concentration of carbon monoxide. I'm going to lower its concentration. Am I going to be at equilibrium anymore? No. No, not at all. So if I decrease the concentration of carbon monoxide, the stress is that I don't have enough carbon monoxide to be at equilibrium anymore. Which way do I shift to counteract that stress? To the right. To the right again. If I don't have enough to be at equilibrium, then let's make some more, so to speak. And in this case, again, we are going to shift to the right. <coughs> All right, next thing we're going to do, we're going to add some more carbon. If we add some more carbon, are we still at equilibrium? Yes. Yes, we are. And if we're still at equilibrium, it's not a stress. Notice it's a solid. It doesn't show up in our equilibrium constant expression. And so by adding more or taking more away, it doesn't shift the equilibrium at all. So solids and liquids do not shift the equilibrium. So no shift. All right, so we got a couple more effects to look at. So to do the first effect, we got to know something about this reaction. This would typically be provided. So I'm going to provide you with the delta H value for this reaction. It would also be something that was provided, but I'm going to see. You guys can probably look at this and figure out what delta H is. What kind of reaction is this? Exothermic. Why do you know it's exothermic? Because it's going down in energy. But how do you know it's going down in energy? How can you look at this and tell me it's going down in energy? Form one product. It's what? Form one product. Not because it forms one product. The oxidation amount. state of <coughs> carbon is going up. And that just automatically in your head spells out no, I'm fishing. lower energy. So it, because it's a reaction with oxygen. What do you call a reaction with oxygen? Combustion. Combustion. Can you name for me a, an endothermic combustion reaction? Yeah, they're all exothermic. So, but this again, this is not something I expect you to know. I'm just quizzing you. They would give you the delta H value on this. And I'm going to tell you that delta H for this is negative 100 kilojoules. So I'm just going to give that to you. That would be given. But you should recognize that since delta H is negative, this is an exothermic reaction. So notice an endothermic reaction absorbs heat. An exothermic reaction releases heat. So notice an endothermic reaction needs heat to happen. For an endothermic reaction, heat is a reactant. But in an exothermic reaction, heat is released. Heat is produced. It's a product. And so here, because delta H is negative, we can treat heat just as if it's a product in the reaction. So we're looking at this reaction in particular. So the next change we're going to do is I'm going to say we're, we're going to increase the temperature. We're going to increase the temperature. 
So if we increase the temperature, what are we doing with regard to heat? Putting it like in the system. Or or the products. So we're adding more heat into the system. Is heat a reactant or a product? Product. It's a product. So by adding more product, which way is the equilibrium going to shift? To the left. To the left. There's another way to look at this. If the forward reaction, as it's written, is exothermic, then what is the reverse reaction? Endothermic. It always works that way. If one way is exo, the other way is endo. Adding heat always favors the reaction that needs heat. What kind of reaction needs heat? Endothermic. So by adding heat, i.e. increased temperature, it's going to favor the, favor the endothermic direction, which in our case is the reverse reaction, i.e. shift left. You can look at it that way as well. Take your pick. Okay. Next case. This is the one that a lot of people struggle with. We're going to increase the pressure, which is analogous to decreasing the volume. Usually we try and increase the pressure by decreasing the volume. So whether we say increase the pressure or whether we say decrease the volume, we mean the same thing here. So if we increase, so why shift right? Why shift right? Because it shifts to the uh, one that has the least amount of volume. So it does. Left. But it's going to go left, actually. So if you look, if we're, if we're decreasing the volume, by in, you know, increasing the pressure and decreasing the volume, we've got less space available. And if we've got less space available, then let's shift the direction that takes up less space, that takes up less volume. But notice, gases take up 1,000 to 10,000 times more volume than solids really wants. So when we're trying to gauge volume, we only look at gases. We can pretty much ignore the solids here. Here we got one mole of gas. Here we got two moles of gas. Ideal gas theory says that it doesn't matter what the gas is, they take up roughly the same volume if they're under the same conditions. And so our products, having twice as many moles of gas, take up twice as much volume as our reactants. So if I don't have as much volume available anymore, because pressure's going up, volume's going down, then let's shift towards the side that has fewer moles of gas. In our case, that means let's shift left. So had we done the exact opposite, had we increased the volume and decreased the pressure, well, if you got more volume, let's fill it up. Now let's shift towards the side that has more moles of gas. Had we done it the other way around. Cool, and if I really want to get tricky on that. Then I'm going to add an inert gas. What does inert mean? Non-reactive. Non-reactive. Can you give me a typical non-reactive gas, Alan? <laughs> uh, argon. Argon's a great one. <clears throat> so like the noble gases. So inert gases don't react. So if we add an inert gas, this one's tricky, especially based on what we just learned. If I add an inert gas, what's going to happen to the total pressure inside the system? Increase going to go up. We're adding more gas. The pressure is going to increase if we're in a rigid container. So, however, it doesn't increase the way this one increased. So, as we're going to find out when we add an inert gas, there's no shift. We'll explain this in just a sec. So, we're going to get back here. We're going to go back through all of these real quick with a brief explanation. But we're going to get back to this one once we've gone through that explanation so we can apply it to that system as well. Okay. If we increase the oxygen concentration, again, like we did at the beginning, by increasing the oxygen concentration, we've increased a reactant's concentration. So we're not at equilibrium anymore, so Q no longer equals K. If I'm increasing a reactant's concentration, is Q now bigger or smaller as a result? So reactants are on the bottom. It's product of reactants. And if we're smaller. increasing the reactants, now our Q is smaller. And so by doing this, Q is no longer equal to K. So, and in our case, Q is now less than K. And what do we say about when Q is less than K? Shift to the right like we already predicted. So we're just going back through something we already hashed out a little bit ago. Tiff. Can you determine um, what Q is again? As far so, as whether it's bigger or less than K? So if you're... Call Q is just the ratio mm -hmm. 
of products over reactants, right? So let's say this system is at equilibrium. So Q equals K. But all of a sudden, like we just said, we add oxygen so that the concentration goes up. And if all of a sudden the concentration of oxygen goes up, that's a reactant's concentration that's going up. And if the reactant concentration just went up, then this ratio just went yeah. down. Okay. And so it used to be equal to K because we're at equilibrium. Now it's smaller. So Q is now less than K. Okay. The, the value of K was always given to you. Correct. So we don't so, need to determine 